I'm delighted to be here today with Perry Marshall, who is the author of Evolution 2.0, which is not only a book, but it's kind of a challenge for those who um, want to enter a, a prize contest that Perry and some other entrepreneurs have put together. And Perry, I wonder if you'd like to talk about that just a little bit and give a little bit of background on yourself before we start talking about the book and also... Um, some science journal articles that you have written. Yes. Uh, in 2019, I announced the $10 million prize at the Royal Society uh, with Dennis Noble and Paul Flather. And uh, it's called the Evolution 2.0 Prize. And it's an award for the question, where did the genetic code come from? And um, it's really a more broader question than that because it's really asking where does any code come from? And nobody knows. Um, there, there's a very deep question in biology, which is what gives life the ability to act on its own behalf? Uh, because uh, you know, chemical reactions all by themselves do not do the kinds of things that living things do. And, and so, uh, like I said, we announced that at the Royal Society, we have judges from Harvard, Oxford, and MIT. And um, it's the largest fundamental science research prize in the world. And our investment group um, looks to, to turn it into a patentable technology. And so, uh, and then along with that, I have a book called Evolution 2.0, Breaking the Deadlock Between Darwin and Design, which looks at the evolution question through the lens of information. And then um, more recently, I'm co-founder of the Cancer and Evolution Working Group, uh, which is an organization of about 1,500 scientists that are looking at cancer as an evolutionary phenomenon. And that is part of the American Association of Cancer Research. So we've got our fingers in a lot of pies. They're all very intimately related to each other. And we're going to have a great conversation today. Well, so just out of curiosity, I noticed that you had a conversation with Dr. Michael Levin earlier. Is he a member of that Cancer and Evolution Working Group? Um, he uh, he presented to our group uh, a couple of times in the last year. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, he has uh, been very active in several aspects of it. Uh, and Michael is one of my favorite scientists. Um, I think he's asking questions that uh, most of the profession is nervous to even acknowledge. Yes. And uh, I, I love those kind of people. Um, he's, yeah. he's really blazing new trails. I had a conversation with him just the other day. Um, ma mainly it was between him and John Verveke, who is a cognitive scientist. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those off the hook conversations, which was very enjoyable to be a participant in. So, um, so in your book, Evolution 2.0, you, you just give a lot of tremendous information. And um, one, of the, one of the pictures that you use when you're talking about... Karen? Yes. Every time you move your papers, it's very audible. And I'm oh, just, wow. Okay. Sorry. I, it, it, could it be that you're using a different microphone than you think you are? Or sorry to interrupt you, but... I, no, I'm glad you did. Yeah, I, I, I certainly don't want that kind of noise in the background. I will be more cautious. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So in your book, you talk about the Russian doll analogy and yes. in chapter six. And I thought it might be very interesting for you to explain that to the, uh, to the viewers. So information is always organized in layers. And this has a huge... Um, impact on the kinds of questions that we need to be asking about evolution. And anybody can readily understand what the issue is here. Um, all of us who send videos to each other or email attachments or text message back and forth all experience this all the time. You just don't realize that you already know what this is. And so, um, so Karen, if I send you an email or if, if you send me an email, um, you, you type an email and then you attach a picture and you press send. And what happens is that 
the email and the picture get wrapped uh, or encode. You, you could think of it uh, as the the encoding is like being put in a wrapper, which is put in another. So um, it gets put into an email and then the email has to get put into uh, a software system and then the, and then it has to be put on hardware and then it goes through the internet and then it comes to me and then it all gets wrapped, unwrapped in the exact opposite order that it was wrapped, right? It's, it's just like a Russian doll. Um, you can't disassemble a Russian doll in the wrong order. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and this, this is extremely important to evolution because um, what that means is that any evolutionary process has to respect the structure in which the data is, it is encoded. And so it, 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 what, what it means is that um, the evolution, evolution has to be actively engineered by the organism. It cannot, like it fundamentally in principle cannot happen just as a result of copying errors or external modifications to the genetic code. It has to be unwrapped and then the changes have to be engineered and then it has to be wrapped back up just like you if i send you an email i can't edit the email while it's traveling through the wire to your computer i can only edit it in an editor right like you could get my email open it in an editor and then you could edit it and then you could forward it to somebody else but you can't do it without an email editing program. Okay, and, and all forms of information are like this. We could be talking about genetic code. We could be talking about TV signals. We could talk about internet. It could be radio. It could be um, MP3s. It could be anything. And so- well, And so you have the background to talk about this yeah. because you're an ethernet guy and you actually wrote a book on the seven layers of ethernet, right? Yes, so, that, yeah. that's right. That's so you're right. not just you're not just blowing smoke here. And so yes, it is true that you can make very minor changes in organisms by you know knocking out one base pair or making uh, an an adjustment to one gene. That is true, uh, but if you want any kind of major structural change, like you, you want wings instead of arms and legs, or if you like any significant, like what we would call macroevolution, you cannot do it at the level that has always been said in all the textbooks that it's just, well, you know, it's just copying errors. And this is absolutely critical to ever understanding cancer, understanding infectious diseases, even understanding viruses, you know, the, the mutations that uh, that got us Omicron or, you know, some of the different variations uh, also in, in the virus world, those were not accidental copying errors. Those were changes engineered by other people's human bodies in response to the body having a virus. Like, I don't want this virus. I didn't invite you. What's going on here? And the virus is like, well, I'm here and I'm going to do what I want to do. It's like, well, we're going to have to make some adjustments to this. And the reason that we had all these variants with the coronavirus was because people's bodies were in a symbiotic relationship with the virus and the body was said, well, okay, what am I like? I can't get rid of this thing. What am I going to do with it? And so this notion that evolution is an active process that is engaged by the organism completely turns the whole evolutionary theory on its head. It's a total game changer. Well, so what you're saying basically is that the changes can't take place at the gene level. I think it was you that pointed me towards the, um, the journal article by Heng. Yes. It's about genome level rather than gene level. Could you, could you talk about that just a little bit? Yes, so you're referring to the work of Henry Hang, who has a brilliant book called Genome Chaos and a lot of published papers. Uh, he's a cancer researcher in Detroit. And um, Henry says that uh, there, 
there is a level of organization in the genome called the karyotype. And, and so if, if you go look at, at genetics at, at all, you'll quickly discover that um, like in the human body, we have 46 chromosomes and they are packets of genes that are uh, wound in these spiral patterns. And the nucleus of a cell has all of these chromosomes and it's packed into a three-dimensional structure. And this three-dimensional structure is not accidental either. Um, it is organized so that genes that need to be near the surface, that need to be accessed frequently are near the surface and the genes that aren't accessed frequently are closer to the center. And that some of the information that determines the physical characteristics of the organisms is not just from the ind individual genes, it's from the three dimensional structure of the karyotype. So it's kind of like a hard drive that has a very complex three dimensional shape and the shape of the hard drive is part of the information that's coded. It's not just the ones and zeros. And what he's observed is that uh, when cancer cells are hammered by chemotherapy or radiation, they go to, into a massive restructuring of the karyotype that may not even be detected in genome sequencing because most people are not paying any attention whatsoever to what is the three-dimensional shape of the chromosomes and the karyotype in, in the nucleus. And he says that cancer cells are rearranging, um, doing massive rearrangements on a three-dimensional scale of, of the shape of the genome um, as, as a fundamental change in their physiology. And so this is why um, this is why tumor cells massively mutate under radiation. And this is why your sister-in-law gets cancer and she freaks out. And then she goes to the oncologist and she starts getting treatment. And then she calls you two months later and says, my numbers are improving. The radiation is working. And then four months later, she's dead. What happened? Well, a few species of cells mutated into 10,000 species of cancer cells. And there's no way any one treatment is ever going to take out 10,000 different species of cancer cells and the cancer goes all over her body. And part of that adaptation process is the karyotype changes. And so you can't even beat cancer until you properly understand evolution. And you have to understand that the evolution is a intentional behavior by the cell under the control of the cell. It's not something that just passively or randomly happens. Well, so this intentional behavior of the cell under the control of the cell, um, where that first seems as though where that first became um, part of our knowledge base was through the work of Barbara McClintock. Yes. So could you talk about her a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so I think Barbara McClintock is arguably a greater scientist than Charles Darwin, even though most people have never heard of her. Why? Because she was the first person to cause evolution to occur in an organism by an intentional act and then understand genetically what happened and explain it. So this was in the 1940s and she was hitting corn plants with radiation and damaging the chromosomes and she wanted to see what would happen. And so she damaged a plant in such a way that it was unable to reproduce because it had missing information in uh, some of its chromosomes. And, and then the plant repaired the damage and it went on to reproduce. And what she figured out had happened uh, was to give you an analogy, it was like um, somebody had erased parts of a software program and the organism had said, well, I've got a whole, I've got a whole line of code missing here. I've got a chunk of code missing here. 
But let's see, I think if I copy this code over to here, if I copy this code over to here, I won't have something that is, it's exactly the same, but I will have something that will work. But and, this is something the plant was doing itself without yes. any interference from Barbara yes. Hitchcock. The corn plant did this all by itself. The corn plant repaired its own genome uh, with, with parts of other chromosomes by moving transposons around. Transposons are the genetic equivalent of adverbs. You know, like you, you know, you take an adverb like, you know, he he walked through the living room and it, you change it to, he walked through the living room softly. Like it, it was like he took adverbs and rearranged them and he got this and she got the sentences to make sense. And then the plant could reproduce. And then she figured out exactly what had happened and she documented. Well, this was so radical at the time. Everybody thought she was crazy and she presented it in 1951 at a symposium after doing all of her homework and scrupulously checking out everything. And uh, half of them laughed at her and half of them were angry. And they were like, woman, you don't you know, genes build plants, plants don't build genes. But see what she had discovered is yes, they do. So it's almost like an MC Escher drawing where the hand is drawing a hand that yes, the genes and the chromosomes build the plant, but the plant modifies and builds the genes and chromosomes. And so that means that the gene or the DNA is simply an organ of the cell under control of the cell. And so it took decades for the world to catch up to what she had done, but she won the Nobel prize in 1983. Um, and the fact that most people are still hearing more about Charles Darwin than they're hearing about Barbara McClintock and people like her is just a symptom of the fact that most of the field of evolution is decades behind where it really should be. It's certainly what the public hears. I mean, I'm not suggesting that all biologists are decades behind, but you know, what's in the textbooks, what gets taught to most college freshmen and sophomores is 40 years out of date easily, maybe 50 or 60. Well, speaking of um, <clears throat> scientists and biologists, and I believe that Dr. Michael Levin is a synthetic chemist, is that right? Or Well, he has a degree in computer science and a degree in genetics and a degree in biology, if I right. recall. So it's, it's a stir fry yeah. of multiple yeah. disciplines. But I think I heard him one time call himself a synthetic chemist, but... Okay. But I'm, I might have gotten that mixed up with somebody else. But but um, I want to throw something out for you here. It can take me just a second to set it up because um, I've spent a lot of time listening to Michael Levin. I've had him have conversations on my channel with Dr. Mark Solms, who is also a neuroscientist, and with Dr. John Berveke, who is a cognitive scientist. And certainly Michael Levin is willing to go where other people aren't willing to go, especially when he's talking about cognition and how far down the chain cognition goes. But for me, one of the most interesting things that he talked about was that um, cells communicate with each other via this bioelectric signaling. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that DNA does not include is information about where to build a body part. Yes. They know how to build a body part, but they don't know where to build it. Yes. So this bioelectric signaling, the way he describes it, says to this group of cells, you go over there and build that leg or you go over there and build that eye. Mm -hmm. Certain questions occur to me that I've never had a chance to talk to him about because I always have him talking to somebody else and I don't want to interfere with their conversation. But I'm going to throw these questions at you okay. because you've also looked at a lot of his work. And there's going to be a few questions and then I'll wrap it up at the end and then you can start answering. So don't, don't go question by question. Okay. So how does each cell know its part in the building of an eye or a leg? So Levin says that the bioelectric signaling tells them where to build. The DNA tells them what to build. But the thing that the DNA does not tell them is when to stop. So he finds it very uh, intriguing that 
the you know, you have a bilateral body and, and both these legs are growing, 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 and then they both stop at a certain point when they're when they're the right size. Or if the planaria is uh, reproducing itself, if it gets cut in half and has to build another one, it will actually shrink down the half that isn't, um, that isn't quite ready yet in order to meet the size of the, the other half that's growing. And so somehow it knows when, how far to go and when to stop. So the questions occur to me, that do the cells, each of them within each cell, do they have a blueprint? Or do they each have a connection to some entity in the organism that has a blueprint? Or do they keep building until something constrains them to stop? Now, you contend that cognition is found in all living cells and provides life's power to evolve. Mm -hmm. But just beyond evolving, let's just take a look at an organism that's just, you know, um, growing up to its, its potential. Let's say uh, a planaria starting with a single cell eventually grows into a full grown planaria that which then has the ability to uh, rebuild itself every time it's damaged. So I guess the background of my question goes into this computation issue. And that is that um, if you look at cellular automata, cellular automata is following a rule. It may be a very simple rule. And when it fills that, when it follows that rule, sometimes a very simple rule can produce an irreducibly complex design. Yes. But if you could imagine that each cell actually was aware of its state inside the design, mm -hmm. then that the cell, and so I'm thinking of a cellular automata cell as being analogous to a living cell. Mm -hmm. It needs to know, it needs to have an awareness of the cell on either side of it and and the potential of where it might go from there and then it executes the rule based on its awareness this would be if a cellular automata could be working on its own without a rule because the the um, the living organism seems to not have a rule about where to stop and yet the cells seem to know where to stop <laughs> and that to me is one of the great mysteries um, and I just want to tie that together with Barbara McClintock in this way. Jordan Peterson is always talking about the narrative of life being, this is what is, and that is what should be. I'm here now. I want to walk across the room and get to the other side of the room. If something intervenes between here and there, I fall into anomaly or chaos or... Mm -hmm some disturbance happens. Barbara McClintock's plant cells had an anomaly happen to them when she intervened, right? Yeah. And they had to deal with that anomaly. They had to fix the problem somehow. We know what it takes for a human being when we know that when a human being runs into an anomaly, we, we have to grow our capacity to deal with the anomaly. So every anomaly that we fall into helps us to grow in wisdom or strength or perseverance or whatever. And I'm wondering if there's a similar thing happening at the cell level. So that was a long question, but you're the guy to ask. So <laughs> so I, I would like to suggest a framework for how we can think about these things. Um, that, that's really pretty simple. And the framework is, is that life is fractal and that all cells are self-aware and that self-awareness goes down at least to the subcellular level so it's really just two things fractal self-awareness so let's take those in turn so if anybody listening hasn't gone down the fractals rabbit hole, you should like go to YouTube and type in fractals and like it, watch at least 20 minutes of whatever you find there. Uh, there's lots of great stuff out there. It's easy to find. 
but it's it's the idea that sim simple repeating patterns and formulas can create very complex things that repeat at scale okay and so um so fractals tell you that the little stream of water running through the corner of your yard on a rainy day in the mississippi river aren't really that different from each other one is just a million times bigger um and fra you go into fractals and chaos theory and and you learn that the tiniest little variation in the initial condition when you when you run that formula a million times produces changes you know three months later they're com completely incalculable and that's the butterfly effect mm -hmm. that the butterfly's wings can cause a hurricane in six months later in that it, it's it's all so sensitive that you can never entirely predict it um and so when i say that life is fractal what do i mean by that what i mean is that you and i are having a conscious experience talking to each other. Now, I only know my conscious experience, but I am pretty sure that Karen Wong is also a conscious being having an experience of having a conversation that, and that I know what it's like to have a conversation and so do you. Well, I don't know about, do you have a dog? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I have a dog. Have you ever thrown a steak on the kitchen table and you say, Gracie? don't eat that steak. The dog goes, <laughs> why want to eat the steak, right? And, and you know, when you leave, that Gracie is going to decide to either obey you or jump on the table and eat the steak, right? And I am pretty sure that Gracie is having a conscious experience of listening to me say, don't eat the steak. And I'm also pretty sure that when I go down in the basement and, and a cricket sees me and freezes, um, that it's having some kind of a conscious experiment, experience. And, and, and I don't think it's aware of as many things. And I don't think it's contemplating the meaning of life the way we do. But I think it knows what it feels like to be threatened. I think it knows what it feels like to be scared. I think it knows what it feels like to be hungry. And if you, if you talk to any cell biologist, they'll tell you cells are no different. Okay, go go type in white blood cell chasing germ uh, on YouTube and, and go watch the white blood cell chase the germ around and ask yourself, well, is this really any different than my dog chasing a rabbit around in the backyard? I don't really think it is. Okay, so I think that all life is sentient. And it's quite apparent, like, especially if you look at Michael Levin's work that self-awareness has the ability to be joined together so multiple cells share the same self-awareness instead of a million cells being a million individuals. And this is, I, I don't know how it works. I don't claim, I mean, I know people that are experts on multicellularity and maybe they could tell you, but I think we can, we can all agree um, that, you, you know, you and I are not having a trillion experiences. We're having one experience, even though we have a trillion cells, that, that somehow those experiences are able to align and we function as a single organism instead of just a blob or, you know, just a, a lake full of algae. Well, and then, well, oh, this is one of the things when, that went, okay, go ahead and finish. So, and, and then, and then, when you get to Mike Levin's work and he cuts a planarian worm in half and now it's two and the tail grows a head and the head grows a tail and now you have two separate organisms, it's also clear that that can be divided and you can divide one being into two. And you don't have to explain how that happens to observe that it happens. It's very clear that it does. And the questions of how does this work is the real questions of biology and evolution. I think arguing about genes, you're just moving deck chairs around on the Titanic. Uh, genes is not where the real action is happening. So I interrupted you. Go ahead, Karen. Well, I was just going to say, when you were talking about 
the the cells each having sentience and then when they come together they have a group sentience that's exactly the fractal pattern of of human beings coming into community and the yes. importance of community right and one of the other things that levin had mentioned about cancer is that a cancer cell is actually a cell that has disengaged itself from the rest of the cells and then gone off on its own, which is not that different than a human being that disengages from the community mm -hmm. and becomes nihilistic and, and decides to destroy everything, right? I mean, yeah. it, I mean, I think that the pictures are the same. We might anthropomorphize it differently because of the way we think about things, but it's the same structure. Oh, I, I Communities like gathering into nations and, and, and all of that. Yeah, I think a, a tumor is like a, a terrorist group or a refugee camp or a like a, a a group of rebels that has split off and is trying to do a coup and you know tra traditionally in previous decades of biology these kinds of anthropomorphisms have been frowned upon i think that's a huge mistake i i think the own the easiest most accurate way to at least initially approach these questions is anthropomorphically. Mm -hmm. They are more like you than not like you. If you want to understand a community of bacterial cells, look at a community of people and make as many parallels as you can. And at some point I realized the parallels will break down, but you know, probably the first six or eight are probably going to be exactly right. I, I think that's exactly how it works. Okay, cool. So, so we're on the same path, on the same track. Um, so you, because you say how, how it works is, is the big question, but um, you don't have, do you have a, a thought in there about how the cells decide when to stop? Or do you think that's just one of the big unanswered questions? Uh, well, I would go to what do we already know about that sort of thing? So proprioception mm -hmm. is, okay, if I close my eyes and I can't see my hand and like, is, is my finger going to touch my nose when I think my finger is going to touch my nose? Like even if my eyes are closed and most of us, like we're within about a centimeter, we know where our fingers are. We know where our elbows are. We know where our, our arm is. Um, and it's, I don't even know how we would walk or function in the world without proprio perception. So what if proprio perception is not just for brains, but it's for the entire body. And what if it's part of development, um, that, that those spatial relationships are, I don't exactly know how they're encoded. I think there there could be 10 Nobel Prizes on the way to figuring out exactly how that's encoded. Um, but you think it's part of the I guess what I would. Well, I, I think it's I, I don't even know if it's not just genetic coding. Yes, it's part of the coding, but it's coding writ large. It's it's not just genes or chromosomes or base pairs. It's also um ion channels and bioelectric fields and all of the mechanisms of communication that exist in the human body. It could include exosomes, which are, they're kind of like viruses in little packets that get sent back and forth between cells as a means of communicating. Um, I don't even think we know all the ways that cells communicate. I think they probably communicate in ways that we've never even imagined. Like there, there, there's a fascinating book and I, I was told about it by Michael Levin is one of the most interesting books I've ever read. It's called soul of the white ant. And it was written in 1936. And it is a book by a guy who meticulously studied termites. And one of the mysteries of termites is that if somehow or another you go inside the termite colony, uh, termite colony and kill the queen, 
all of the termites instantly know that the queen is dead and and the behavior of the entire colony immediately changes even the ones that are far away now how do they know this well i don't know but i could give you a comparable a comparable is rupert sheldrake did a bunch of research and there's been multiple people that have done this where they proved that if you never go home for lunch, but you decide to go home for lunch today, your dog knows you're on your way before you get there. Yeah, I've, I've heard him talk about that, yeah. Now, now there's there are lots of experiments where that have shown that this kind of thing happens in all kinds of different contexts, and it's not just dogs. How does that work? I don't know, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. There, there's a whole lot of people that will they'll, they'll, they'll go to their grave insisting that it's impossible because we don't have an explanation for how it's actually happened. Well, I think that's just silly. That's putting the brakes on science. There's some explanation. And just because it doesn't fit into your existing senses or your, your five senses or the equipment that you have, it, it doesn't mean that it's not real. That's cool. So now we brought Rupert Sheldrake, <laughs> yeah. the soul of the white ant. That's, you know, I live in California, so um, termites are a big thing here. They're incredible <laughs> creatures. Like, I'm no fan of termites, but, you know, they build these huge mounds. I've been to Africa and I've seen them before. And the, the sophistication of a termite colony is just, I mean, it puts any American corporation to shame. The, the, the level of harmony and I mean, termites, termites will, they'll go in these long um, brigades and they'll like, they'll dig these little tiny holes and they'll go hundreds of feet and, and then they'll, they'll go off to a source of water and they will bring back water into the termite colony one drop at a time. Like there were termite mounds where like, where do they get water? And they find out Oh yeah, they go like a quarter mile or or uh, six hundred feet or like some long distance. There's this tiny little hole, and these little soldier ants or or termites are they're going down there. They're getting the water. They're bringing one drop of water. It's incredible. Well, okay, so I I've heard lots of stories like that about all sorts of creatures, and they always make me wonder. I know that for you, evolution is a uh, is not something you're the least bit afraid of. You 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 agree that evolution occurs. Mm -hmm. um, but what is the evolutionary explanation for something like that? I mean, I hear scientists say, well, you know, natural selection, the ones that are more successful at getting the water. But I mean, now, come on, really. You have to go back to the very first move that any one of those organisms made in order to... <clears throat> You know, is it the guy that could go two feet rather than one foot that got selected and then the one that went three feet rather than two? No, because until you get to the source of water, you're dead. You don't get right. the water, right? right? So so there's a big lag between, which, which says to me that, okay, evolution, fine, but there's some form of information that the entity has aside from the evolutionary process. And I don't know if that's what you're getting at with your question about code. Um, well, natural selection, like evolution <laughs> through natural selection is very, uh, it's always offered. Well, well, the termites evolved through evolution through natural selection. Well, let's stop for a minute. First of all, it's natural selection through evolution. It's not evolution through natural selection. Natural selection does not cause, directly cause the evolution of anything. Okay. That, that's like saying, if, if somebody said, well, how did Seattle win the Super Bowl? And somebody goes, playoffs. Well, okay. They won the playoffs, but the playoffs is not the explanation. Like, well, they had a coach and they had an offensive strategy and they had a defensive strategy and they had a recruiting strategy. And there's a whole bunch of details to all of this. And all of those were the actions of agents consciously and willfully carrying out their work. So 
It's not evolution through natural selection. It's natural selection through evolution. And natural selection is an outcome. It's not an explanation. You have not explained anything when you have said that. Okay. You have just avoided explaining anything. And it's lazy. It's pure laziness. Well, it, so, makes, it, it makes it so convenient because everything can be explained by that. And yeah, the conversation is over. Yeah. Everything is explained by saying essentially nothing. It, it, it contains no information, okay? And so how does evolution really happen? Well, Barbara McClintock started to figure some of it out. The, the plant starts rearranging genes and chromosomes. And now Barbara asked really, I think, the, the greatest question of all, which is what does a cell know about itself? How does the corn plant know that if I take this piece of this chromosome and stick it over here, even though this has never happened before in the history of the earth, and even though this particular mutation has that was forced upon that plant has never happened before in the history of earth, how did it know what to do? How would it know that might work? And I'm, I'm not saying it absolutely knew that it would work. I'm saying it, had, it did something that had a statistically favorable chance of working which is much better than just rolling random dice. So at the bottom of this is there's this question of self-awareness. What is it? How does it work? At what level does it operate? And I think the only way you ever get to the answer to these questions is looking very, very closely at what's going on to actual organisms and, see, and just asking, what do they do? And the questions may in fact be bottomless. You might, you might end up being at the subatomic level before you find the answer. And we might be hundreds of years from the answer, but we can do better than say natural selection. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things that Michael Levin talks about is his little xenobots. I don't particularly like the way he addresses his narrative, but he says his xenobots got free of the of the frog and he takes the skin cells and frees, gives them freedom from the frog and then these free little xenobots go over there and do what they really want to do which is build another creature yeah. and that little creature floats around in the in the medium whatever it is and can actually propagate itself it can it has motility because parts of the skin cell that were used for some other purpose it it advantages over into little legs that can float around and Mm -hmm. Now, now they're doing what they want to do. They're free. Yes. Well, yeah. Whether whether they're better off than they were before when they were part of the frog, that that's a that's a question for dispute. But um, one of the things he said was this happens in less than forty eight hours. So in less than forty eight hours, you have a new creature that has never been seen before, that has no evolutionary history. Yes. And that somehow these cells knew how to gather together and how to create something that could survive in that environment, mm -hmm. which for me is the, here's what is, what should be is I need to survive. This anomaly happened to me. So what am I going to do? That requires a level of self-awareness that yes. you don't hear other scientists talking about. In fact, it's a little bit hard to even get Michael Levin to talk about it. Although well, he is working with, with Chris Field and, uh, and Carl Friston to to look at the physics of maybe how far down that awareness can go into the subcellular level. So well, so so there are some scientists that will go there. Um, the American Association of Cancer Research monthly Cancer and Evolution series um, in June we had a. Uh, a session on cellular cognition. We had Frantisic Belushka, James Shapiro, Dennis Noble, Michael Levin, Pamela Lyon, and I, I might be forgetting somebody. And we were all discussing the self-awareness of cells and, and proposing that you have to think of cancer as being its own individual self-aware organism. Now, with, with Michael Xenobots, let me give you, let's take this fractal and self-aware and let's do an anthropomorphism um think of the frog as general motors and think of 
think of the cells as employees that got laid off. Um, and like they went into work and everything seemed to be fine. And then they get called in this meeting and they all got sent out the door. Bye. And they went out in the parking lot and they said, uh, let's make an alternator factory. Uh, we'll supply used alternators to the OEM market and we'll, we'll sell them on eBay. What do you think? Because uh, you've got a machine shop and I, I, you know, I got some electronics experience and you, you, you know, these magnet guys and, and they go off and five people, you know, and, you know, maybe their new little company goes out of business and they die. Or maybe it turns into like the next, success magazine cover issue. I mean, I don't know. Was it good for them or bad for them? It, it just depends on how it turns out. But but the point is, is they had a choice to go out on their own and they were they were threatened with, with uh, you know, d dying and they innovated something to try not to. Well, I'm a business consultant. I deal with this all the time. Well, 80, 90% of the time, they go out of business and it doesn't work, but five or 10%, maybe 20% of the time it does work. And now you got a new career. I mean, my whole marketing career started when I got laid off from my engineering job in 1995. So, I mean, welcome to the world. It, it's, it's the same all the way down as what we experience every day. That's, that's such a great picture. And when you were talking about it, what sprang into my head was the movie. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Company Men. I don't don't know that movie. One of the great movies of all time. Okay. My, it's my husband's favorite movie. We probably watched it four or five times at least. Yeah. Uh, ben Affleck and uh, Tommy Lee Jones both work for this big multinational company. And they were both pretty high up in the company. They were friends and... The, the guy who was CEO was also their friend, but then he goes off and does the, the whole, you know how the guys in the suits are always bad. So it's one of those movies where the guys in the suits are bad. Of course. <clears throat> and he decides to have a big layoff to improve the efficiency of the company. <clears throat> so the whole movie is about these guys getting laid off and how hard it is and the impact it has on their families and all of that. But at the end of the movie, big spoiler alert here, a few of the skin cells get together and start their own little business. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. had started out as a big shipbuilding company and then went some other direction because shipbuilding isn't really a thing anymore. But these guys found a little a hole in the wall in some big old factory that wasn't being used anymore. And they rented that and they started their own little company. So that's exactly your picture. <laughs> yeah, I well, I I really I think that's that's accurate, and um, uh, I think uh, if you want to understand cancer and tumors, I think you should study mass movements. I I've got a a book called The True Believer by Eric Hofer. the The subtitle is called Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements, and it talks about how a disappointed, disillusioned, disaffected group of people comes to be, and then they agree to form together and commit themselves to a cause. And that's what's happened, like, you know, the Nazis or the formation of any religion or like all kinds of things like that. And one of the characteristics of a mass movement is that everybody is in lockstep agreement that they're reading from the same playbook, they pledged the same pledge of allegiance and they're completely unified. And if you study biology, you're like, they are a single multicellular organism. And in fact, part of the psychology of mass movements is that there is a, um, there is an exhilaration of completely aligning with a large group of people on, on, on one thing. And anybody who's been, you know, at a, at a, a football game or a baseball game and ev like everybody's rooting for the same team and, and experiencing that, or 
everybody who's been part of a religious observance where like everybody's taking communion or everybody is like doing some ritual and they're all in unison there's a there's a there is a psychology to that um and uh there's a oneness to that and I, I think that it's perfectly appropriate for us to understand that what we experience at the human level is common at a whole bunch of other levels and that it is fractal and that, um, you know, you, if you, 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 leave, you put cream and sugar in your coffee and then it sits on the counter for five days and, and five days later, there's green mold growing on top of the milk. Okay, that little colony of mold is a community with a whole set of experiences and operations that is more alike than different to, you know, a bunch of kids on the playground or a company. Um, and <laughs> they're... There, there's a song uh, by Rush called Natural Science that expands on this idea, and I can't quote any of the words, but you know, you'll find this in literature, you'll find this in poetry. I, I think one of the, the poverties of modern science is that scientists are not sufficiently literate in the human realm to recognize that what they're doing already has parallels and has already been understood on other levels. There's so much in that. Um, I'm just gonna put this in as a placeholder. Maybe we can talk about it some other time, but <clears throat> if, uh, <clears throat> if, you're, if you're saying that mass movements and uh, true believers and these rigid ideologies are equivalent to something like a human body. There, you, you can have a rigid ideology, but then you can also have a truth. And, and there's the only dissimilarity is that the ideology has become rigidified and is only a partial picture of the truth, right? Where, yeah. where, I'm a Christian, so for me, Christianity is a truth that is not rigid and is not closed. It's an it's <clears throat> it's an open system, and it and it is it's complete. It's not just half. So you could have the left and the right. Each of them has half, and they've become rigidified in this that this picture that they have of the world that has locked them into this lockstep and given them this sense of virtue and uh, power and everything else but but when you take both halves and they have to work together it's like a marriage mm -hmm. because now you have opponent processing and opponent processing has this level of creativity that arises out of the two different viewpoints and i wonder if there isn't something about that in the human body that would be different than just a rigid um ideological trap or mob rule or something like that so i think you're really onto something with that question and so if if you think of let's think of a of a corporation or a university or a school or any human institution and let's draw an analogy between that inst general motors let's say okay general motors versus the human body now, I work with lots of CEOs, and any CEO will tell you that boy, it's, it's a lot of work to get an organization to everybody's operating at their peak performance, and everybody's cooperating, and everybody's communicating, and, and the trains are running on time, and everybody's showing up on time, and everybody's delivering on time. That's a lot of hard work. So let's just imagine that General Motors was as well organized and, and efficient as my body or your body. Okay, you've got 10, what is it? 10 trillion or billion? I even, I'm sorry. I, I think it's trillion. Okay, you got 10 trillion cells. Yeah, it must be. You got 10 trillion cells. And as far as I can tell, 
they're about 99.5% doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Like the digestion is digesting and, you know, the lubrication is lubricating and the sweat is sweating and, and, and the 98.6 temperature is regulating and, and the heart is beating. It's remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. Now, is it any coincidence that St. Paul talks about the church as a body? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that it wasn't true when he was writing it, but now it's, you know, billions of members. And we can all agree that it's very disorganized and there's lots of problems. <laughs> there's lots of things to be ashamed of. And I don't think you or I is going to argue with anybody about that. But what if the church or General Motors or any of our human institutions really were as well organized as a human body? And wouldn't it also probably be true that most of the members would be happy? Now, what does cancer tell us about this? Well, I think cancer is mostly a response to stress. And it's what happens when some of your cells they're, they're, are going, I'm tired of this. The food is bad. The atmosphere is bad. The air is bad. The work is bad. The hours are too long. I want to get out of here. And if you, if you uh, watch my most recent podcast with Azra Raza, she talks about cells going into mutiny and, and doing that. Uh, in fact, uh, she thinks that one of the things that happens is your pancreas cells who can't go anywhere because they're stuck being a pancreas cell. They form a symbiotic merger with a white blood cell. And now they got a, a physical ticket out because a white blood cell can propel itself and move around the body. And that's how, that's one of the mechanisms of, uh, of cancer spreading through the human body. So I think these analogies are all appropriate and they may not be perfect. I admit that they're not perfect, but they're actually much closer to the truth than some long complex explanation about some uh, you know, molecular biology mechanism that involves 17 molecules or, or, or something um, that is so granular that it doesn't ever give you any big picture of what's going on. Well, it's just thrilling to hear that you, you have an in with uh, cancer researchers to bring this perspective. I, I just think that's amazing. Now, I, I know that our time slot was from 11 to 12, are you completely I have a hard that? stop in 15 minutes so we'll in definitely have minutes. okay so let's let's just go a few more minutes then um you wrote this uh journal article called um i just printed off one page of it biology transcends the limits yes. of computation yes biology transcends the limits of computation and on page three i think or on the third page of it it's actually a different page in the journal Page, pages 88 through 101, I think it is. Um, you said, if it can be proven that information or mathematics itself cannot be reduced to computation, then such a proof would shake the very foundations of science itself. It would mean that science's goal of defining rules for everything is impossible. This paper provides such a proof. Yeah. And I made a note for myself in the margin it appears that you see computation as a reduction. Mm -hmm. that it can be reduced to computation, but I think there's another way of looking at computation. Okay. So before we talk about that, could you just explain what you meant when you said that? If it can be proven that information or mathematics itself cannot be reduced to computation, then such a proof would shake the very foundations of science itself. Yes, there, when, when you, you go to college, you take physics and chemistry, engineering, in any of these fields. There is an implicit assumption. Uh, it's so universal, it's almost not really stated. You spend all of your time trying to like, learn, well, what's the formula for gravity? What's the formula for 
throwing a baseball? What's the formula for magnetism? And, and everything is expressed in mathematical terms. And usually a good chemist, a good physicist, a good anybody like that is somebody who can, they know which what the formula is and they can plug in the formula and they can predict it and understand its behavior. And there is an implicit belief that is absolutely pervasive throughout the entire educational system and the entire scientific industry that it all is math and it all follows mathematical laws and it all follows fixed physical laws. But I don't think that's true. I think that's true of inanimate objects like rocks and buckets of water. I don't think it's true of living things. Living things don't just obey mathematics, they create mathematics. And this is why reductionism has spectacularly failed to explain biology. It has failed not a little, it has failed spectacularly. The Human Genome Project did not deliver 10% of what it promised. We do not understand what consciousness is. We do not understand what makes biology alive. We have hundreds of thousands of professors that think that they have made a, a, a sensible statement when they say life evolves through natural selection, when in fact they have not said anything of any substance whatsoever. We have spectacularly failed to explain biology. And in my paper, I have a mathematical proof. It's not even possible that everything is computation because even mathematics can't come from computation. Mathematics computation comes from axioms. Axioms are not computed. And I don't have time to unpack that. Any mathematician would understand that what I said is as basic as crayons in mathematics. And so I think therefore biology has gotten cause and effect backwards. Um, biology says that chemicals produce codes which produce cognition. And I say, nope, cognition organizes codes which control chemistry. And that's the correct order of cause and effect. Well, so I don't see any, um any opposition in that idea to what Wolfram is saying? Mm. Because even though he he's talking about the world as being computational, it starts with a rule. Right. Right. So so the cognition precedes the the um, the execution of the rule. Uh, right. Right. And and as long as we agree on that, then I am absolutely. 100% with Wolfram. Now, I don't know what he thinks, and it's funny you bring him up because I've been communicating with his office about this this week. Oh, so really? Because I've been wanting to talk to him forever, but I don't know how to communicate with his oh, office. <laughs> I, I, I've i never talked to him. Uh, he's hard to get to, but I have talked to one of his people and I can connect you. Um, but but uh, yeah, like, uh, and it's a very deep philosophical problem. Well, where do these rules come from? Where do the rules of the universe come from? Where do the rules of the Big Bang? What were the rules before there was a Big Bang? Like, I mean, these are really deep questions, mm -hmm. but they may be, you may have to answer those questions before you ever can explain biology completely. It very well could be the case. Well, I know you've had a little bit of a, an online communication with my friend, Glenn, the physicist, yes. about um, his ideas about computation and I would love to have opportunity to line the two of you up for a conversation if you would be open to that. Sure. But one of the ways that he describes computation is not strictly in this mathematical sense of computation, but that in the sense of formal languages. And he likes to use the phrase that it's, it's a symphony of choices over time. And if I put it together with an idea that, um, the philosopher and physicist Wolf, Wolfgang Smith made when when he was talking with us. Um, he talks about vertical causation 
And one of the examples he used was that Mozart used to say that when he, a symphony would come to him in an instant into yeah. his mind. Mm -hmm. And then it would take some time to unwrap it. It's like all the layers of code, right? Yes. Unwrap it, lay out the different parts. Each part would be a different formal language for each musician to play. Mm -hmm. And then each musician does the computation in order to play the part. And then when the whole thing comes back together, you have something that is greater than all the parts. Yes. That's the sense in which Glenn talks about computation from mm -hmm. the standpoint of a mathematician and a computer science and a physicist. And I think the two of you could just have really um, fruitful conversation. Well, I, I agree. And the story you told about Beethoven, J.K. Rowling got Harry Potter the same way, stalled train, about three hours, like this idea just came to her. She's writing as fast as she can in her notebook. And then she spent something like seven years untangling it. Like, in a sense, the idea was complete, but she still, it, it's not like the whole book was dictated to her. It was like she had this idea, the idea was intact, and now she had to figure out how to express the idea. And tons of artists and poets and authors and even engineers and creative people, they, they'll, they'll all talk about this. I think this is also a clue. Mm -hmm. um, like ideas come from somewhere. Yes. Okay. And, and the, the Greeks believed this 2,500 years ago and all kinds of, and like, I don't know how any scientist can sit there and go, well, you know, Beethoven didn't really know what he was talking about. Right. I, come on. Um, so where is somewhere? I don't know, but well, we get to ask, you know, and, and, and you know, you talked about how scientists, uh, are sometimes hesitant to talk about this kind of stuff. Well, they are, unless they're in a safe place. Like I think the cancer and evolution working group was a sufficiently safe place that everybody felt like they could talk freely about that stuff. Fortunately, my paychecks aren't written by NIH or NSF or a university or anything. And I can say anything I want. And so I'm saying it. Um, I think there's a lot of people that think similarly, even though they may not come out and say it. Uh, I keep bumping into them over and over and over and over again. Well, this has been thrilling. I've really appreciated the opportunity to have a visit with you, Perry, and uh, very excited about your prize. And one last question. Did you offer the prize because you secretly believe that there's no way that it could ever be won? Or do you actually think that it's a possibility that somebody could find an answer to it and that it would be very useful tool for science. If you go back to the very, very beginning of the prize in the early days, and there's a chapter in the Evolution 2.0 book. Mm -hmm. this, I was just trying to score a debate point and like get somebody to shut up because no, we haven't solved this and nobody knows a code that's not designed. And it was really uh, kind of like the intelligent de design guys, like you're not going to solve this. And if you go back 10 or 15 years, that's where my head was at. I believe that it is in, at least in principle, that it is solvable. Um, I believe that the way to solve it is to understand more about consciousness and cognition and what those things are composed of or where they come from. And I think that it's like there's a missing law of physics. And once you figure that out, then the rest will follow. And so I do not believe that it's impossible and I'm just keeping a secret. I, I talk openly about this. There's a blog post I wrote called Ways to Win the Evolution 2.0 Prize, where I go into a discussion of six or eight or 10 things like here's a rock I think people need to turn over and study harder here's another one here's another one um, I've alluded to some of those already um, and you can go deeper into that but I think it may be winnable um, you know as a Christian I think 
uh, God made the world to be intelligible and discoverable and not just be this impenetrable mystery. Mm -hmm. But I, I like the verse that says it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and it is the glory of kings to uncover it. And I, I think one of the privileges of being a human being in this magnificent universe that we live in is we get to peel the onion and peel the onion and peel the onion and so i'm going with the hypothesis the the onion can be peeled it can be understood maybe not all of it but we can always do more and more and more and we get to do it and it's our privilege and and it's one of those onions that's a never-ending onion yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And if it weren't that way, then there would be an end to our learning. And that's just not possible. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. This has been great, Perry. Thank you so much. You have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. You asked great questions. You clearly very well read. And I just want to encourage you in your pursuit. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.